This morning, we worship together as we come before uh, the Word. Um, If you're visiting, uh, please do come back. We do have some really good teachers that teach behind this this, uh, podium in the Sunday school class hour. My commute has extended, uh, and uh, I get an opportunity, more of an opportunity to listen to Mike Black and as he goes through the Proverbs and then Luke and, and Mark Newman as he goes through uh, the Gospel of Luke and, and what a rich study it is. Um, we'll be referring to Luke in our text this morning. Uh, we're looking at a tremendous messianic text in Isaiah chapter 61. So please turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61. We'll look at the full chapter. We'll read the full chapter, 11 verses, but primarily looking at the opening of the of the text Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 through 11 may the Lord bless the reading of his word and our study in it uh, together our brief study in it this morning Psalm uh, Isaiah 61 verse 1 the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance to our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified, that they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolation of many generations. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks. And foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. But you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and burnt offering. And I will faithfully give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will recognize them because they are the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with with a garland, and the bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and the garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. May the Lord bless our time together in the reading of his word. This is the inerrant word of God. In these first 11 verses, we see uh, or in this chapter, chapter verse, chapter 61, it points, Isaiah is pointing to the full scope of the ministry of the Messiah, the anointed one. Verses one through three, depicts the mission, the ministry and mission of the Messiah in two advents, both the first advent and the second advent, the first coming of the Messiah of Israel and the second coming of the Messiah. First, the coming of the Messiah is the favorable year of the Lord. You'll notice the year of the Lord. It's a period of an extended, it's an extended period of time. That's the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The second coming of the Messiah is the day of vengeance of our God. 
It is brief, sudden, a moment in time, a day of vengeance of our God. This is the second coming of the Messiah. In verses 4 through 11, the writer depicts the restoration of his people accomplished. I'm sorry, 4 through 11 depicts the result of the second coming of the Messiah. Verses 4 through 9, the restoration of his people is accomplished. And then verses 10 and 11, righteousness for his people is provided. Isaiah wrote this text some 700 years prior to the birth of Christ, prior to the first advent of the Messiah who would come. The kingdom here in Israel at this time is split. It's divided under the judgment of God due to their idolatry. It was a, a trying time, a, a, a time of great mourning and uncertainty, of anguish. Israel or Ephraim is to the north and Judah to the south. And we see Jerusalem and the temple were still intact in the southern kingdom of Judah, where Isaiah primarily ministered. Uh, Isaiah's ministry would span over the reign of four Judean kings, Uzziah in the year of King Uzziah's death, and Jotham, Jotham and Asa, and lastly Hezekiah. The Assyrians were the dominant force in that time during Isaiah's life. Uh, they were the dominant military power and the primary enemy of Israel, of Judea. Uh, they were agents of judgment. They were agents of judgment against Israel for their idolatry against God's people. And so as agents of, of, of judgment, they were, they were fierce. Under King Uzziah, I'm sorry, under King Hezekiah, Isaiah witnessed firsthand the miraculous defeat of the Assyrian army under King Sennacherib. And they had Jerusalem surrounded. King Sennacherib later, it would be found um, in what was the ruins of Nineveh in Iraq, uh, the, the uh, 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 cylinder of King Sennacherib's history of the event. He said he had King Hezekiah shut in his royal city like a bird in a cage, surrounded. And yet the Lord delivered Jerusalem in a single night. Uh, King Hezekiah went to pray at the temple. He sought counsel with, uh, with Isaiah. And the Lord answered and delivered Jerusalem in a single night. They woke up in the morning and they found Sennacherib's army slain, 180,000 dead, conquered, perished by the Spirit of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. And though they held them captive for a moment, they were vanquished. The enemy was vanquished. They had them surrounded and held captive like a bird in the cage, and yet the Lord God delivered them without a single arrow being fired, without any of man's efforts. It was the work of the Lord. And as amazing and miraculous as that act of deliverance was, the Lord would reveal through Isaiah, the prophet, an infinitely greater plan of salvation for his people, to deliver his people who were held captive by an infinitely greater enemy than King Sennacherib or the Assyrian army. It was the enemy of sin that held natural man captive. And he would be sent, he would send the servant of the Lord to set them free, to establish an eternal kingdom. And all through the person and work of the chosen servant of the Lord. And our text begins with that. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the, Lord, because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah chapter 53. Philip runs alongside him, is sent alongside him, and the Ethiopian eunuch asks this important question. Please tell me, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? We could ask the same question in Isaiah chapter 61. Of whom does the prophet say this? Is it himself, Isaiah, or is it someone else? 
Previously, Isaiah spoke of someone else, King Cyrus of Persia, who would redeem or release the prisoners of Israel free from the captivity of Babylon yet to come. Could it be him? Well, the future king here, the future uh, 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 anointed one here is neither. Uh, the central theme throughout the prophetic book, prophetic work of Isaiah is pointing to the servant of the Lord. Each of the descriptive characteristics throughout this text in Isaiah 61 is the characteristic of the servant of the Lord. It's not Isaiah. It's not Cyrus. It is but the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the Jews, the Christ, the Savior of the world. Isaiah 42, verse 1 speaks of this. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and I will be, bring forth justice to the nations. Isaiah 49, verse 6, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Isaiah 53, verse 11, as a result of the anguish of, my, of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. The work of the servant of the Lord, the ultimate work of the servant of the Lord would bring restoration that we just read about, justice, salvation, and justification for God's people. Not only the people of Israel, not only the chosen of Israel, but to all the nations. This is the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. The word Messiah is the Hebrew for anointed one or chosen one. It's the same where we get the word Christ uh, in, from the Greek, anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we, we, you'll remember a picture of this. It's beautifully pictured in the anointing of King David when Samuel goes down to Bethlehem to see who it is that God has chosen to replace Saul as king. The Lord has told Samuel it will be one of the sons of Jesse, but Samuel does not yet know which son specifically it will be. You'll remember that David is left. He's the youngest of the brothers and is left in the fields, not even in consideration uh, to be this anointed one, the chosen one to replace Saul as king. They first bring out um, well, before going, Samuel is told, the Lord tells Samuel to fill his horn with oil and to go. And off he goes. Samuel brings his sons, Jesse brings his sons to Samuel and leaves David, the youngest, in the fields, tending the sheep. The oldest is Eliab. He's brought forward. No doubt he's the strongest. He's the biggest. Um, he's one that all would consider, surely this is he. He's brought before Samuel. And Samuel thought those words exactly. Surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord tells Samuel something. He says, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And one by one, the brothers were brought before him, before Samuel. And as each one passes by, each one, it is repeated, the Lord has not chosen this one either. The Lord has not chosen this one either. And Jesse runs out of sons and is forced to admit there's one more. There's one more son. I have one more son in the fields. No one would have expected. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, the Lord said, Arise of David, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. That's significant. He anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord 
came mightily upon David from that day forward. It was a public display of God's choosing of this anointed one in King David. He was very much a type of the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the chosen one of God, who was infinitely greater than King David. And in public display, we would see this picture that characterized David at this time in the suffering servant of our Lord. Isaiah characterized this servant of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2. This servant of the Lord, the suffering servant of the Lord, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the parched ground, and no, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. We see that in the ministry of the Lord. Nothing in his outward appearance appealed to the nature of fallen man or of Israel. Um, <clears throat> they were not what, he, what they were expecting. He was not what they were expecting. But he was the anointed one of God. But here you'll notice in, verse, in chapter 61, the anointed one of God was not anointed with oil, but rather with the spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon the anointed one. If you have a study Bible, you'll notice perhaps a note in there that says the three persons of the Holy Trinity function together in this verse. And we see that rightly when the Spirit of God anoints the Lord Jesus Christ at his baptism. We see it fulfilled in public, in his public display of baptism in Luke chapter 3, verse 22 and 21 and 22. The Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form like a dove, and the voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Later in chapter 4, Jesus goes from there, uh, full of the Holy Spirit. He would be led into the desert for 40 days of temptation before Satan. And yet, come out of that sinless, conquering the temptations of, of, of the devil. And afterward, Jesus returned to Galilee in chapter 4, and it said specifically, in the power of the Spirit. So here in Luke, as you're going through Luke, you see the Son of Man, this anointed one of God, beginning his earthly ministry. And I think you're early in the study of Luke where you're seeing that being brought out. And so we see this being fulfilled early on. This is the anointed one of God, the Son of God, chosen to usher in the full redemptive plan of the triune God. That is what the Messiah came to do in the first advent, in the year of the favorable year of the Lord. That was his mission, his purpose in his first coming to accomplish just that. The Lord has anointed me to bring Good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is the mission of the first advent of the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus Christ. After the 40 days of temptation in the desert, Luke records that Jesus returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. In Luke 4:14 4, through 15, the news about him spread throughout the surrounding districts, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Turn with me now to Luke chapter 4, and we get to where this text is fulfilled. In Luke chapter 4. He returns to Galilee in verse 14 teaching in their synagogues in verse 15, and then here in verse 16 is where we'll begin. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as, he was, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. He stood up to read the scriptures, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery to the sight of the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the intendant and sat down and the eyes of all of the, in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they were all speaking well of him and wondering at what great, what gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not the son of Joseph? Is this not Joseph's son? Here is described what the work of Christ was set to accomplish in the first advent, the first coming of Christ. He was to bring good news to the humble, to set uh, to, uh, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the release to captives and freedom to prisoners. He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to proclaim recovery of the sight of the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and proclaim the favorable year of our Lord. This was the mission of Christ. And he would go on from there and do just that in the preceding chapters, all throughout Luke. In Luke chapter 4, verse 31, he would go to Capernaum. And from there, by the power of the, his word alone, he set the man imprisoned by demon possession in bondage to the powers of the darkness. He set him free by the power of his word. In verse 38, we see Jesus would heal Peter's mother-in-law. In chapter 5, Jesus heals the man afflicted with leprosy. In 5, 6, 17, he heals the paralytic man. He would then go on to give sight to the blind and even raise the dead to life. Over and over and over, we see the miraculous works, the physical works of the Messiah, full of grace and truth and power of God. And it... It is said that in John, John's gospel, it said that um, if he were to write everything that was written of what Jesus did, all the books in the world, he supposed, could not contain it. That's how much work uh, the Lord Jesus Christ performed in Israel during the first advent. It is said that there was never a time in, his, in the history of the world in which a single nation was more healthy and was healthier than the time of the end of Jesus' first advent. Countless many had been healed of their physical infirmities during the course of Jesus' earthly ministry. This evidenced, this evidenced the reality and the truth that he is the Messiah, the anointed one of God, full of grace and truth, full of the power of the Spirit. And all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth. But that's not why Christ came primarily. Um, the Messiah came uh, not merely to affect the physical, but rather the power of the Messiah was over the spiritual. And it was made abundant by his power over the physical. To the Pharisees, he would say in Luke chapter 35, in chapter 5, verse 31, it is not those who are well that need a physician, but those who are sick. And he would continue, I have come, I have not come to call the righteous, or rather the self-righteous, which were the Pharisees, but the, the sinners to repentance. The problem was the infirmity of sin and the need for salvation for that. It was a spiritual need. To Zacchaeus, he would write and he would say in Luke chapter 19. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, those who were lost. The great enemy of fallen man is not leprosy, it's not COVID-19, it's not sickness or death. The great enemy of our time is sin and the wages of sin, our own personal individual sin before a holy and righteous God. And this is why God, Christ the Messiah came to display these works, because it was to display 
in the presence of the people his power over sin. In Matthew 9, when he heals the paralytic man, he doesn't begin with the healing, but rather he says, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees complained, who are you to forgive sins? And he responds, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralytic man, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And the paralytic man, he got up and went home. But the, when the crowds saw this, they were all struck and glorified God who had given such authority to man. This is the authority of the anointed one of Israel, of Isaiah chapter 61. This is what he preached. Uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn over their sin. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who are bankrupt in their spirit because of the weight of sin. Blessed are those who mourn over sin, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, not for physical uh, healing, not for physical luxuries, but blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is what Isaiah is writing for, for uh, when he re referenced the Messiah and the work that he would accomplish during the first advent and the mission of which he was first sent. And this also typified Isaiah as well. He was one who was brokenhearted, who mourned, was poor in spirit. You remember when he's displayed before the holiness of God, he falls and he cries out. When confronted with the pure holiness of God, he cries out, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. These are his sheep. These are the this is the response of the true people of God, the people of his own possession. And this is who Christ came to save. He came to seek and save those who are lost, his own, a particular people, a people whose eyes have been opened to the spiritual poverty in light of the righteousness and holiness of Almighty God. This is what the Messiah came to save. This is, these are whom Christ came to save, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. To open their spiritual eyes and to see the chains of their sin, the bondagement that they are held captive by sin and utter rebellion against God's righteous demands. These are the ones whom he has shown their spiritual brokenness and recognize that it is only in the person and work of this Messiah in which they can find reconciliation, restoration, redemption, freedom from the bondage, justification, and full forgiveness of their sins. And this is where the great physician heals first and foremost in our heart, the dead heart of fallen man. The anointed servant of the Lord accomplished that work by first becoming the servant, the suffering servant of our Lord. In Isaiah 53, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. And by us, and, and all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The saving work of the Messiah to set the captive free from sin and the penalty is all but by the sovereign grace of God. Charles Wesley would write of this, long my in spirit, imprisoned spirit lay, imprisoned by sin, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused the quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be 
that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. If you are in Christ, he died for you particularly. In his sovereign grace, he chose you, plucked, as Dan often refers, as a brand from the burning. But we cannot respond to this in faith, in repentance, in our own way of our own volition. The work of the Lord is required. That I, the fuse, the quickening ray, I woke, and the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. This is all but by God's sovereign grace. And we see that here in Isaiah 61. And when Jesus read in the presence in the synagogue of Nazareth, he read from this text. Um, and we see the response of the people there in his presence as he began to shift from this wondrous good news to the full scope of salvation to a particular people, to a particular people. And it, the crowd responds. Look at their response in the sovereignty of God and his work and elective grace. Luke chapter 4, verse 23, he picks up, or in 22, they pick up, is this not the son of Joseph's son? Jesus didn't leave it with them happy and feeling good about themselves. He struck to the heart and he began to speak. And he said to them and expounded even further, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum. Do here in your hometown as well. The people there were merely focused on the physical, the immediate. They wanted a Messiah that would give them freedom in the temporal, but not freedom against their sin and bondage to it, for they loved it. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own town in his own hometown, but I say to you in truth, there are many widows in Israel in this day, in the days of Elijah, when the sky shut up for three years and six months, when the great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Zidon, Sidon, to the woman who was a widow, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage at hearing this. They were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to, brow, to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff, down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. It was not his time. We cannot respond to the message of God's sovereign grace by our own volition. This is our reaction, but by God's grace. We are the same. Men are intrigued of the person and work of Christ. We make movies of him. We talk of him. He's a historical figure. We talk of him as a great teacher, perhaps. Uh, even a godly man. But natural man will not bow the knee by their own division, by their own volition. It requires the work of sovereign grace to do just that. All the surrounding districts had heard of the power of the Spirit in the Lord Jesus Christ. The expectation they had were merely outward expectations of outward benefits, of temporal freedom. Uh, an earthly king that would reign before them. They were worldly minded. They were worldly minded and their heart was far from God. And Jesus exposed their rebellion and enmity with God right away. And this was their response. This is the response of natural man. Their reaction to God's sovereign election is startling, but it's revealing. It's revealing by our own response to this, but by the grace of God. This is you and me, apart from his grace. You'll notice that Jesus' recitation of Psalm 61 in Luke 4 stops midway through verse 2 to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. When Jesus quoted this passage, he was stating the favorable year of the Lord had arrived. 
The Messiah has come. The anointed one has come to usher in this age of grace and to perform the work of grace ultimately on the cross where he would satisfy God's righteous demands. However, the second part of that verse had not yet been fulfilled. And even today we await that moment. The day of vengeance of our God has not yet come. This is where the anointed one of God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will return, not to redeem or to bring an olive branch, for that has already happened, but to judge. He will come and return as a judge. Of all those who rejected him, who reject him and cling to their sin and rebellion and unbelief, he will come with a sword to judge the enemies of, his, of, of the Lord God and to restore his own and to establish his kingdom forever. Those who reject the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will be found rejected by him. They will be found in their sin and will pay the just penalty for their sin and the righteous justice of God will be poured out upon them in eternity. That is the justice of God. This is the day of vengeance of our God, which is, not, which is to come. It is a day like a thief in the night. He will come. It will be swift and immediate. It's not the year of vengeance of our God, but the day of vengeance of our God. This is in his second advent. But for those who are in Christ, we found with full of rejoicing and praise. You'll notice at the second event, rejoicing and full of praise. Israel re will be restored in the second event. But also notice that the Lord will cause justice, will, will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before the nations. For the Messiah is our righteousness. He is our only source of praise. He is our righteousness. He is our praise. And because of him, we have been clothed in his righteousness and have cause to praise. If you're here this morning, this should lift your heart as you consider these wonders, this wondrous work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Charles Wesley closes in that great hymn, no condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne, and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? That is just what the, uh, the Isaiah writes. If you are trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins, what a great cause of praise and rejoicing we have. There is no condemnation in him. There is no longer any condemnation for your sin. You were once captive. You were set free in Christ. You can boldly say with the text, uh, in the earlier text, in the other, earlier verse, um, in verse 10, I will rejoice greatly in my Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Christ paid the debt to set the captive free. The debt of sin is paid in full in the person and work of Christ on the cross. And if you are not trusting in the person and work of Jesus Christ, then you stand condemned as you are. As you are, you are condemned in your sin. There is no cloak of righteousness upon you, no robe of righteousness to shield you from the holy righteousness of God and his due wrath. You stand broken in bondage to sin and nature's night, dead in your trespasses and sins, not just spiritually poor, but spiritually bankrupt with no righteousness, no goodness in and of yourself. And so the plea during this time of grace, this year of favor, uh, this age of grace is to look to him while there's time Look to him, consider the sinless son of God, who for the joy set before him willingly laid down his life and shed his own blood at the cross, where he bore the full wrath of God for all who trust in him. 
There is no sinner too great for the Lord Jesus Christ to say. There is no sin too great for the perfect, holy righteousness of Christ to cover. So come to him, trust in him, look to him. And I think I'm looking at those who already have. Rejoice in that. In this world, you will have trouble. But Christ has come to overcome the world. Yes, these are difficult days. Isaiah lived in much more difficult days. And yet he looked with an earnest hope to the person and work of Christ. We look back to the person and work of Christ in his first advent. But we also look forward in hope with eager anticipation of when we will be set free from the, from the bondage of this world. We have already been set free uh, from the bondage of sin in eternity. We are sealed and secured in him. And so we have every cause to rejoice. And though the world may, cause, may bring troubles into our life, our eyes are not set upon the things of this world. Our eyes are set upon the person and work of Christ. And it's in him alone that we have hope and freedom and bondage, freedom from the bondage of sin. Our chains have fallen, fallen off, have been stripped away. Our sin has been tossed as far as the east is from the west. The Lord God remembers it no more. So let's give thanks to him. May your eyes be set upon him, the author and perfecter, of our salvation. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you for this brief moment in time today, this, this wonderful time that we can step away from the cares of the world and, and look to your word, study your word, that our eyes would be set and our feet set firmly in Christ and the person and work of Christ who is our salvation, the anointed one of you, in whom your favor and righteousness rests. When we see Christ, we see you. We see the living God. And yet, fully man, who identified with sinful men, yet without sin, to give himself as a propitiation, as a wrath-bearing, satisfying, atoning uh, atonement, due to our sin. And there on the cross, your wrath is fully justified and we have peace with you. And because of his work, he is ascended above and seated at your right hand. The work is, a, is finished and he is seated and awaiting the day in which he will return not only to restore Israel, uh, believing Israel to yourself and bring them to repentance, to, but to bring out from every tongue, tribe, and nation a kingdom before you, a great bride presented to him in which we have the privilege to be a part of. So we thank you. We pray that you would lead us from here. Grant us ears to hear, eyes to see as we continue in the second service, looking to your word, uh, which is our strength and hope and our only weapon to combat the world in which we, we have through your Holy Spirit. So we pray that you would encourage our hearts, lift us up, and ultimately be glorified in us through your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.